Hello, I'm Scott Thompson and welcome to After 10. Korea, the world's powerhouse of information technology, and the United States, the world's powerhouse of advanced technology. What kind of synergy effect can we expect between the two nations in the field of science and technology? On today's After 10, we're joined by someone who's made great contributions to building up cooperation between Korea and the U.S. in the field. Many important figures from the world of science and technology gathered to boost Korea-U.S. cooperation in the field of science. There's a person who has been an advisor to the president of the KSEA, or the Korean American Scientists and Engineers Association, putting much effort to promote Korea-U.S. science and technology cooperation. He is Professor Sylvester James Gates from the University of Maryland. Being an advisor for President Obama's Council of Advisors on Science and Technology, he received the U.S. National Medal of Science in 2013 for his efforts in the field of science in the United States. Meet Professor Sylvester James Gates and hear more about the significance of promoting Korea-U.S. science and technology cooperation. Professor Gates, thank you very much for being on the program. Mr. Thompson, thank you for the invitation. Now, I know this is your second time in Korea. Tell us about what's brought you here this time. Sure. So uh, this time, I'm here on a project, basically. We're looking for uh, exploring ways to align opportunities for young people in Korea to interact with young people in the United States around the issues of entrepreneurship, innovation, the kinds of things that will drive economies as we go into these next couple of decades. And I know one of the items on your agenda while you were here this time, this, uh, this recent time, was addressing the National Assembly. Tell us a little bit about what you talked about. Sure. Well, first of all, it was a great honor. Uh, I was invited uh, by Jungo Lee to speak, uh, to make, basically provide a briefing, talking about the opportunities and uh, challenges for both countries. A number of uh, representatives of the National Assembly showed up. I was very honored that so many people would come out. It was a uh, a placard with my name, I was really quite surprised. And the discussion was actually very rich and deep. There were questions about efficiency and, uh, and how one uh, manages efficiency in terms of government disbursements and, uh, and funding science. Uh, there were questions about uh, uh, the issue of what what is what is uh, really a way for Korea to, to uh, wrestle with uh, her continued challenges in terms of facing towards the West, and then we, of course, have local challenges. So it was an incredibly rich discussion. I was uh, very honored, and the fact that so many of the National Assembly representatives came out was, again, something that impressed me a lot. And in terms of uh, achievements, of course, we always judge these things based on results. What uh, sort of achievement uh, would you say, or achievements have come out of uh, this uh, workshop uh, recently? Well, I think the, well, first of all, I think it would be premature for me to even reveal things before the final report, but I can make some guesstimates about what will be there. I think one of the things that we're going to, that's going to be in the report, is to talk about how you um, get to a better level of effective performance in terms of uh, innovation spin-offs. So, you know, there are a lot of young people who want to start companies. The United States, of course, is very well uh, prepared to do this there, and particularly in our Silicon Valley. So what are we doing in order to make sure that young entrepreneurs here in Korea have access to that kind of spin-off and incubators and what have you? And I think we're going to identify some better pathways for that. So I'm, I think that's going to be really, really important. You, you, uh, you don't want to spill the beans completely on the report, but what are some of these ways to uh, enhance the cooperation between the two nations and, as you said, get uh, younger people more interested and involved in, in this area? Sure. So, you know, of course, uh, one of the big problems, at least in my country, is the whole issue of visas. And so that's one thing we're going to be talking about, what might be done to, for the two gov bilaterally for the two governments to discuss this in such a way that you lower the bar barriers for young people uh, to participate. The other thing, of course, that I think that is a, a real pressing issue is something that's rather curious. It turns out that the size, that there's this very strange imbalance between the two countries. In the United States, our corporate side and our innovation um, structures have a real dying need for your large numbers of young people. And yet when we look at our native-born population, uh, the availability is not so great. On the other hand, here in Korea, there are many, many young people with uh, 
the proper training for this. And so what can the two nations, so it, it's very funny because the two nations have these two issues where it looks like the, each other nation has a solution to the problem. It right. would be great to actually be able to see that happen. Well, let's talk a little bit about how you yes. yourself first got interested in these cooperative projects sure. uh, between the two nations. Where did the interest come from? Well, uh, it actually goes back a little bit of uh, time uh, to 2000 and, uh, 2010. Um, I, by that point, had been serving on PCAS for several years. In the United States, we have, there's an organization called the Korean American Scientists and Engineers Association, KSEA is the acronym. And KSEA is actually, it's a wonderful organization. It goes back to 1973 in the USA. But what it has actually done is play the role of a bilateral sort of uh, connectivity between the two countries. And so I was invited to give an address uh, at the annual meeting that uh, KSEA held that year. Uh, this was in um, Park City, Utah. And I went and I gave an address on what we were doing in terms of PCAS and technology and education here in the United States. And I met uh, the president of KSEA, um, Dr. Uh, David Hushin Lee. And David and I developed uh, such a great rapport that I was invited to serve as his advisor because the KSEA pre, uh, president has an advisor and I was invited to serve in that capacity. And then of course, once I took on that responsibility, then I had to learn more about how things work between the two nations. I, I knew what it looked like on the American side. What did it look like from the view from Seoul? Right. And what did you learn? Oh boy, what did I learn? Well, in that first visit, uh, we uh, learned first of all that, well, first of all, we learned about amazing Korean efficiency. Uh, it turns out that I landed with, uh, out my luggage, and the next morning I was scheduled to have a briefing in the National Assembly. And it was a Sunday night, and by 9.30 of that night, I had a whole new wardrobe so I could make the presentation to the National Assembly. If that had happened in reverse, the briefer could have never made it. Stores would have been closed. Cl everything would have been closed. Right. And so I was immediately impressed. Gee, what an amazingly efficient society. And I, I have to tell you that I've continued to see that kind of efficiency. Uh, I would not be surprised if uh, with appropriate sort of conditions met that there will be a groundswell of young entrepreneurs in this country taking advantage of the efficiency by which the country is already operating. You talk about this, uh, this, this idea of efficiency. How does that relate to uh, the field of science as mm -hmm. you see it here in Korea? Sure. Well, that's a little bit more complicated. First of all, um, Korea is a unique country in the world. It is the only country that within the last 50, 60, or 70 years has gone from being a developing society into a developed society. There's no other country in the world that can make that same boast. And the way that Korea did it is also very clever because what she did was basically invest in um, industry that would be global in terms of its marketplace. Now, the role of science in this previous incarnation hasn't been so much. Korea has not been called upon to create her own science, but to efficiently use the science that's there, as well as to uh, increase capacity for Korean scientists. This has been occurring because, in fact, if you look at how Korean scientists have interacted with the world, what you find out by large numbers, I think that some statistics I suggested, if you ask the question, uh, let's take all the Korean scientists that interact internationally, and then we can ask uh, how many of those are interactions are with the United States. It's around 30 to 40 percent. So Korea has always for a long time said, you know, we're going to get our science capacity built, and we're going to do it by bilateral collaborations with the United States, and then, of course, others. So that's what's worked in the past. That's not going to work in the future for a number of different reasons. Why is that? Yeah. Well, a couple, couple of different reasons. First of all, the model by which uh, modern Korean society has uh, been built, that model itself is going to change uh, principally under two impacts. Robots build cars now, not people. And when you combine robots with information technology, it means a lot of the kinds of jobs that we're used to seeing in manufacturing concerns, those jobs are going to disappear. So if you're, you know, if you're a financial minister or someone responsible for a national economy, you have to be worried, how, how am I going to build jobs for my population? And so that means that where are the jobs going to be? And we think uh, by uh, numbers of analyses that lots and lots of countries, you can kind of figure out what are the growth industries for the future. And in fact, Korea is only one of seven countries that has positioned herself in the 16 technologies that were picked out about 10 years ago as being the leading efforts where global economies are going to grow. And what's really interesting about that to me is 
When you look at, for example, Europe, there's only one country in Europe that's actually positioned themselves as well, and that's Germany. So the country's done a great job preparing herself for this transition, but now she's got to actually make it. Right. And that transition is partly it's going to be in terms of how you educate your people and give them the skill set that's required to work in this new economy. And there is a paradigm here in Korea for that. It's called the creative economy. It's exactly the right thing to do this. You mentioned that you are working as an advisor to the president of KS, uh, KSEA. You're also working as an advisor for President Barack Obama's uh, Council of Advisors on Science and Technology. Uh, what is your uh, role there sure. in the U.S. as an advisor uh, to that council? Sure. Um, my role in PCAS is rather interesting, I think. Uh, first of all, uh, in PCAS, we are private citizens, so we're not actually government officials. And, w and one of the things I always like to tell people when I speak to them about my role in PCAS is nothing I say should be taken, interpreted as an official government statement because I'm not part of the U.S. government. Not, none of us on PCAS are. We're a collection of private citizens. We are statutorily charged with advising the President of the United States on any issue having to do with science and technology. PCAST is not new. It's been around in one form or another since the Second World War, although it's changed its names and what have you. But it's always served this function. So what do we do in PCAST? Well, essentially the question is, how does science and technology solve the country's problems? This President, as we talked about earlier, has a real affinity for thinking about science and technology as a, as a tool for transformation. And in PCAST, the, the quite range of questions is incredibly broad. So for example, um, we have done now three reports on what's called STEM education, STEM, science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. This aligns, by the way, with the creative economy, it aligns with the entrepreneurship and the innovation that we see in the US, United States as how we'll get to the future. Uh, so STEM education, we've done actually three different reports on STEM education, the most recent on what are called MOOCs, Massive Online Open Courses, which are these new ways of teaching people. Uh, PCAS uh, has also done reports on information technology. In the United States, if you actually look at the country's principal national economic strategy, it's called advanced manufacturing. That idea began with PCAS because we had seen some models that, that were brought forth by one of our members, Dr. Shirley Jackson, who's a president of Rensselaer Polytechnic uh, University. Uh, we've talked about health information technology. We've talked about um, high-speed uh, communications in terms of the need for us to reformulate the way that the FF, the F, uh, Federal Communications Commission, FCC, what are the rules for how you actually license the use of cell phones, for example? So we, uh, agriculture, uh, wherever technology can solve the problem, PCAS has probably looked at it. It's, it's a broad spectrum, it Incredibly sounds Incredibly like. broad spectrum. You talk about the problems that science can help to solve. Yes. When you look at the problems uh, today, what do you see as being uh, some of the bigger problems that you're trying to tackle right now? Sure, and uh, as I said, in the natural environment, it's pretty clear, sustainable energy, clean sustainable energy, part of the same mix. Um, in terms of uh, other things, I, what I sort of think of as the, the man-made part of the environment, uh, we're obviously wrestling with the problem of how do you build what we call an innovation-based uh, entrepreneurship-driven society where the American dream can be sustained. And this is a very different challenge for the country. As you know, uh, since uh, 2008, the United States has not had the best of the economy. We had a crash. Uh, millions and millions of Americans lost jobs. Um, we have not totally recovered from that situation. And now we are also confronted with the impact, the continued impact of globalization, as well as the new impact of technology. Uh, one example, well, Google is building self-driving cars. Now, if you stop and think about that for a moment, you'll say, well, you know, so maybe that's not so important. But then you, in, a, in our, my country, in the U.S., trucking is a major way we get goods and services around. Well, if you have self-driving cars, you can have self-driving trucks. And now you start to think about the implication of that for the society because that, uh, in the trucking industry in the United States, there are about 1.5 million jobs and now you bring in this technology that works cheaper. Uh, the technology doesn't unionize. It doesn't complain about log hours. It doesn't care about the night. That's a real challenge. How are you going to make that transition? And so uh, these sorts of ways of using technology 
to sustain the American dream. This is not going to happen by accident. And this is a large part of the work that we do in PCAST. Let's talk about getting uh, more young people interested in science and technology. You mentioned STEM education yes. earlier. Uh, if you would, explain this concept to us and what it's really trying to do, trying to get more young people sure, interested. Sure, sure. Well, first of all, of course, there's an acronym, S-T-E-M, and it stands for Science, Technology, Engineering, and Mathematics. Uh, in the old days, and the old days were 15, 20 years ago, uh, when we talked about the technical preparation for a society, it was... Um, it was a very hierarchical structure because what you needed was great engineers, great scientists uh, in an ecosystem that allowed innovation to come about. And then you needed a workforce that didn't need such skills. For, for example, in the United States, uh, if uh, you were looking in the 50s and 60s at the workforce, uh, there were people who could finish a high school education, go immediately into a manufacturing concern, work there for 30 years, in that time, have enough income to support a family, buy a home, cars, send their kids to college, prepare for their retirement, all with just a high school education. Those days are gone. So if we're going to continue the sustaining of the American dream for large numbers of people, high school is not going to be good enough in the future. It's completely clear. You have to up the skill set. So STEM is one approach to this, to, to bring it to the attention of large numbers of Americans that our traditional American dream is going to depend in having a, a people that are trained at a higher cognitive level to function. So STEM is, no, is, no, is a way to get at that. It's saying that from our very earliest grades, we need to be thinking about training people so that they're computer literate, so that they have a bit more facility in recognizing uh, new methods and innovations in solving problems. And these are the kinds of things that you learn to do in school in these STEM courses. So it's a unifying view about preparing people and the workforce in the environment in which they will emerge. Uh, it also involves making sure that science no longer lives in the ivory tower, that it touches people that they feel empowered by, that they can actually contribute to it because in, with the way that modern communication technology works, the innovation of the internet and the web is not because it connects machines to machines, but it's because of how it connects mind to mind. And you can see this all the time in the internet. You see amazing things. For example, there's a virtual choir uh, where the people, uh, one person said, gee, we would like to compose a, have a choir, and here's a score that I'd like to write to. Upload your singing of a part of one, just one part of this to YouTube. And this has actually been coalesced into an entire piece. So this shows the possibilities of how collaborative uh, the internet makes the world. You can think about doing that with science and technology. And that's why you have to train people to be able to do that. Everything being interconnected. Everything being interconnected. When you look at the, uh, the Korean education environment, you gave an interview back in 2011, I believe, uh, where you agreed uh, basically with Korea's push to expand uh, education in the ba basic sciences. When you look at the education environment here, what do you see? Well, it's, it's really f very interesting to compare the two nations. And I have to say that um, since I've been working in policy like this, I've looked at a number of nations. But when I sort of compare the United States and Korea, uh, first of all, the issues are very different in the sense that uh, in the United States, part of it is that we have a better, very heterogeneous population, uh, heterogeneous cultures, which means that how you engage the American people, has, it can't be a one-size-fits-all. You've got to do the right thing for different groups. And so one of the advantages actually here in Korea is that it's a relatively homogeneous population, a rather relatively homogeneous uh, po uh, set of cultural norms. And so that gives the country a certain advantage in a way because you don't have to think about so many different variations in getting things done. On the other hand, um, what, to me one of the things I learned on my first trip here by talking to some of the officials at uh, some of the companies is that there is a concern that there, even here, there are not enough young people who go into the STEM disciplines after they get their degrees. Part of the reason is a level of pay because, um, at least from my viewpoint as an American, uh, there's not an appropriate equilibration between the, pay people, the way people are remunerated versus the skill set in that 
contribution of skill set to the economy. So that's one thing that I think is going to have to change here. Um, but in the schools themselves, uh, having uh, there's a lot of discipline, which again is a is an advantage, not a disadvantage. But the thing that I find that's sort of most worrisome to me, and it's not this is not just about Korea, because I see this trait in a number of Asian countries I've visited. It's for all our problems in the in the United States. There's one thing that we do that is quite remarkable, and that is we sustain the ability of relatively large numbers of people to be innovative. And how you do that is something I think most of the world still wonders how the United States achieves that. And that's something that I think Korea is going to have to face. I think she's begun to face it. And I, I guess the question is, how do you achieve it? Uh, President Pakane has put a, a great emphasis on, uh, on this. Uh, you mentioned that you're a, a fan of this idea for a creative economy. I am. Um, you already advised U.S. President Barack Obama. Let's say hypothetically you're advising President Park and Hay uh, and the government here. Uh, what would you tell them about uh, uh, making this push and doing it, doing it successfully? I think would make the biggest difference would be for uh, a little bit more flexibility in how young people have choices because that's, I think, part of the secret of how we sustain the amazing amount of innovation that occurs in our country because we have a little bit looser system so that people are not locked in at a very young age. And I would ask the officials here to look at that issue and try to inculcate a little bit more freedom. Now, you don't want it too much, perhaps, right. but, but for people, wouldn't it be great if there could be a Korean Steve Jobs, right? I think and everybody would agree, yes, exactly. it would. Yeah. And so the point is, you've got to have that much laxness in the future to allow that person to emerge, and I think that's a real problem. Creativity coming from freedom, the coming idea. Coming from freedom, right? absolutely. Um, you've been quite involved over the past several years uh, promoting cooperation between Korea and the U.S. Uh, looking ahead to the next couple of years, what, uh, what do you have planned as far as projects and efforts to do that as well? My involvement uh, with Korea has come as quite a shock to me, and I, and I do have to um, thank my friend and one of my current hosts, uh, David Hushin Lee, for introducing me to this realm where I can sort of think about the problems and offer some thoughts. Um, I don't have any sort of permanent contracts. Um, if people here are interested in my continuing involvement, I'll be happy to do so because I enjoy wrestling with problems, especially problems that sit at this policy inner, uh, inner, uh, inner boundary or interleaving between policy and science and technology and culture, because all of them are important in, in this realm. Um, because I'm a little bit of an outsider, or maybe a lot of an outsider, I would, so I would remind people of something that Albert Einstein once alluded to. Uh, he said that the outsider often carries the seed of innovation simply because they have a slightly different point of view. And I'll be very happy to continue to do that if I'm asked. We'll certainly be looking forward to any projects that uh, do come down the pipeline. Professor Gates, thank you very much for coming on the program and sharing your insights. We appreciate it. Thank you, Scott. And thank you, as always, for watching. We'll see you next time after 10.